So welcome to the first ever at UNCG, and I was just saying to the audience, maybe the first ever in the world uh, that we know of, webinars worth watching. Uh, so we'll start out with introductions and um, how this kind of competition came to be. Um, so Greg is out there waiting for one of our judges who's about to come in. Um, and so maybe he'll say something in a second. But um, right now, um, my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian at UNCG Libraries, which means I work with a lot of our online students. Particularly, I work a lot with our online graduate students. Uh, so uh, the reason why we started this competition is some of y'all might have heard of three-minute thesis, this idea of quickly and efficiently presenting about your research uh, for a broad audience to make it clear to understand. Uh, I've always loved that competition, and I also love helping graduate students, online graduate students, too. Um, so I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could include our online graduate students in this kind of competition? So um, we uh, are trying this. So the idea of it, um, that you can go to that website right there, go.uncg.edu slash www if you want to learn more. Uh, but the rules of the competition that we developed are that you need to have a PowerPoint or a Google Slide presentation. Uh, I guess you don't have to, but all of our contestants do. Um, but with no more than 10 slides, including your title slide and your credit slide. Uh, so webinars are limited to 10 minutes maximum. I will be timing these, and uh, I will cut it off right at 10 minutes, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then webinars are spoken word, so you can't, like, sing your webinars. And the minute that they, you start speaking, when, you, when you're clear that this is a, comp, you know, that you are starting your presentation, is when I start my timer. So we have a um, group of um, judges here, which I'll introduce in a second, but they're using this rubric. Um, so uh, you uh, can link out to that later. It's on that website that I mentioned. But basically, it's looking at engagement and how clear the contestants made the research uh, to us. So they will uh, be grading it, and then we will uh, add it up. And we will have a first place, a second place winners, and a people choice. So um, I'll release that form at the end of this as well. Um, so these were our preliminary judges. Um, I just want to thank them in case they're in the virtual room. I know that this has been a busy week. Um, I think Vaughn actually might be, his wife might be having a baby right now. Um, but uh, just to thank them for all the hard work that they did on this, we had uh, three rounds of preliminaries uh, where we picked contestants out of that to pick these final four contestants. So thank you to April Black, Amy harris Houck, and Vaughn Stewart. Um, and you can see their titles there. They're from the libraries. They're instructional technology consultants. And the, Vaughn is the director of the Digital Act Studio. So our finalist judges are here in the room. Um, maybe one more will be coming. So here we have, um, you can't see it. We, I decided not to turn the camera on to not distract you. But we have Karen Bull, the dean of UNCG Online, um, here with us. And we have Lee Phillips, the director of research and engagement. And we might have Andrew Hamilton joining us, the Associate Vice Provost of Student Success. So, um, Greg, do you want to say anything before I introduce the contestants? Um, I, could, I could just say something briefly. Um, so, welcome, everybody. Um, you know, I, I think Sam said it all. Um, I want to give special thanks to her for organizing all of this and, and making it happen, realizing it. Um, as she may have mentioned when I was outside just now, uh, this medium of presentation is just becoming more and more common, um, and what's exciting about it is that it has global reach. Uh, so it's vital that our students have the opportunity and uh, the training to uh, make the best use of it. And today you're going to be seeing the, uh, the, the presentations from the core finalists of this competition, so they really are the best of the best. And as Sam mentioned, there's a people's choice, so we're all uh, paying close attention and getting to choose our favorite. So that's it. All right. Thank you. So, the first up, um, again, I did this by alphabetical order of last names, is um, Elvis Foley from Kinesiology. Um, and he will be talking about biomechanics, birth control, and biochemistry, examining a risk factor for ACL injury using a multidisciplinary approach. So, if the judges want to take a second and write down um, Elvis's name. So, Elvis, are you ready for me to hand you the presentation? Yes, I am. Okay, so here it comes.
And um, take your time. Remember that from the preliminaries, the minute it is clear that you are ready to go uh, is when we start um, judging you. There. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to come and watch these webinars and my presentation here. My name is Elvis Foley and I'm a master's student in the kinesiology department, currently working on my master's thesis. Um, and I'm going to present uh, exactly what I'm studying as part of my master's studies. So uh, please keep your chat box open and available since I'll be asking questions in the chat. So my presentation title is a bit long, but I'd like you to focus on the first three words, biomechanics, birth control, and biochemistry. I promise before the end of this slideshow, you'll see how these um, dis seemingly disparate fields are actually connected to each other and can help solve a problem that faces uh, athletic women. So getting started here on the biomechanics side, um, we're going to consider the ACL, which is the anterior cruciate ligament, and it's a ligament that prevents excessive forward motion of the lower leg relative to the upper leg. Female athletes are at an increased risk of injuring their ACL when compared to male athletes who play the same sport at the same level of competition. And even though this uh, sex-based disparity in ACL injury rates is multifactorial, sex hormones have been implicated in that risk. So my first question before I move on is, does anyone have a friend or a relative who has experienced an ACL tear? And I'll take just a few minutes or just a few seconds to um, let you all respond and I'll address the first two questions that come in through the chat. I see. So from Mark, multiple athletes from multiple sports, um, and a friend from high school. So moving on to our next slide here, um, we're going to examine the effect of sex hormones on the looseness of the ACL. So did any of you know that hormones can affect the ACL? Go ahead and answer that question in the chat here. Okay, it seems most people did not know. Well, hormones um, perform a number of functions, um, but the research has shown that Hormones such as estrogen uh, or estradiol, as well as relaxin, uh, appear to increase the looseness of the ACL, while other hormones, such as testosterone and progesterone, seem to uh, oppose the effects of estradiol and relaxin and lead to a stiffer ACL. What complicates matters is the fact that a number of athletic females use hormonal birth control pills which contain two different hormones, one of which is similar to estrogen. It's called ethanyl estradiol, and it may loosen the ACL. And then a class of compounds called progestins, which mimic the effects of testosterone and progesterone. Uh, the extent to which they mimic these hormones um, is known in uh, biochemistry speak as androgenicity. It's ability to mimic testosterone as well as potency. One type of progestin called levonorgestrel is very potent and very androgenic and thus may stiffen the ACL um, to a greater extent than another progestin that's common in birth control pills called norethindrone. As you can see at the right side of your screen, potency and androgenicity greatly vary 
among birth control pill brands, depending on the type of progestin that's used, as well as the dosage of the progestins uh, that are used in the pills. So, how does one measure the looseness of the ACL? That's a very good question. Um, we're going to consider anterior knee laxity, which is a clinical measurement of the looseness of the ACL, and it's a risk factor for ACL tears. So increased knee laxity um, puts a woman at greater risk of tearing her ACL. As you can see in this first video here, the clinician is pulling on the leg of a participant here, and the ACL restrains the upward movement of that leg. In this second video, you can see me performing uh, the same test, except using a device called the knee arthrometer, which puts numbers um, to this measurement. So I'm able to measure the amount of movement that's restrained by the ACL. So the purpose of my project is to examine the effect of the progestin compounds in birth control pills on anterior knee laxity. We hypothesize that females who are on birth control pills that have greater potency and androgenicity due to their progestins will have stiffer ACLs or less knee laxity than females who are on birth control pills with a lower uh, potency and androgenicity values. So this is what our subjects look like. Of course, um, they are young adult females who use combination birth control pills we place them into four different subject groups depending on the uh, chemical characteristics of their birth control pills. Um, I'm using one of my research assistants here as a model. Additionally, they need to be physically active and they need to have at least one healthy knee that we can measure uh, their laxity. So when our participants come to visit us, we perform a blood draw in order to assess their hormone levels. We test their general joint laxity, which is the looseness of a number of joints, such as their pinky, their thumb, and their elbow. And then we assess their anterior knee laxity, as I had shown in a previous slide, using a knee arthrometer. We have our subjects come in at two points during their pill cycles. Once, when we predict their hormone levels to be the highest, um, the hormones contained in their birth control pills. And then once, when we predict those same hormones to be at their lowest levels. So here is a novel piece of this, ex um, this whole experimental process. We're using a technique called mass spectrometry, which comes from analytical chemistry. And before I explain this, would all of you um, just quickly tell me which Skittles flavor is your favorite? Ooh, we have a lot who love green. And let's see, grape and red. <laughs> so the way I can best explain mass spectrometry is to use a bowl of Skittles. Imagine you are trying to figure out how many red, green, and purple Skittles are in a bowl. So uh, the bowl of unsorted Skittles might represent a sample of human serum. Mass spectrometry is able to detect the color or the molecular weight of a progestin or a different hormone and separate those hormones um, by their molecular weight. So I'm able to know what hormone levels um, a certain person's serum uh, contains. To show you what this looks like without the Skittles, here I am in um, one of the labs here on campus, examining some actual serum and calibrating the mass spectrometer. So what we expect to find, as I said before, is that females who are on birth control pills with a higher antigenicity and potency value will have stiffer knees and perhaps a lower risk of tearing their ACL than females who take birth control pills with less potency and androgenicity. One thing that we want to do is um, provide information to parents, clinicians, and physicians 
um, about the chemical composition of their birth control of birth control pills, uh, so that they can empower themselves and make informed decisions uh, regarding uh, birth control use, um, especially if they're athletes. We also hope to provide new research techniques to um, future researchers in the field of kinesiology as well as other fields, um, so that they too will be able to look at the effects of hormones um, on ACL injuries. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation, and here are my references and acknowledgments. Perfect. You were right at <laughs> like one second before 10 o'clock. <laughs> 10 minutes. So thank you. Um, we are going to take a second to have the judges be able to fill out their rubric. That was okay. again elegant. Um, then we will go. Okay, Jessica, are you ready for me to hand you the reins? I'm going to share first your screen. Sure. The judges are finishing up their rubric, so we're going to um, still take a minute. I just gave my dog a treat that will hopefully last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, who has a very anxious dog, appreciate that. <laughs> a dog would not be cool with me not paying attention to him. Yeah, I have extra treats in the pocket just in case. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, so I think Jessica is getting set up. Okay, Jessica, I'm just going to start introducing you and then I'll hand you the things. But uh, Jessica is from Human Development and Family Studies, and she will be talking about divine thanks. Are religious people more grateful? Yeah. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm hoping that it'll work this time. In the preliminaries, uh, so wait, okay. I'm going to share Microsoft PowerPoint and chat. Here we go. Here we go. It's working today, right? Yes. Excellent. So okay. Mute myself and take a second. Um, and the minute it seems clear you start, I will start the timer. Okay. Getting all my windows lined up. All right. I think I'm ready to begin. As Sam said, my name is Jess Navarro. I'm a PhD student in human development and family studies. And this is my master's thesis. It was entitled Divine Thanks, an Examination of Religiosity and Gratitude. And this kind of came out of research that uh, my research lab had done for several years, looking at the development of gratitude in children. And a lot of the children, and particularly their parents, in the interviews had talked about their gratitude to God. And it was something we hadn't really looked into yet in our lab. And I was really interested, particularly as a parent, you know, um, does this matter? And so, the big question sort of around this research that I was asking was, um, are religious people more grateful? 
And we know that gratitude is you know, featured in so many different religious texts, in the Quran, in the Bible, um, in all sorts of different scriptures and hymns, and that giving thanks is a daily part of religious life for many people. Um, and so when I looked over the literature, I found that, yes, the literature really does say it looks like religious people are more grateful. And this lined up with what our participants had talked about. They had said, talked a lot about their gratitude to God and how important God was in their life and how grateful they were to him. When I looked a little bit closer into the literature, though, I found that gratitude and religiosity were conceptualized and measured differently in all the different studies. And so it made it really, really, really difficult to make any generalization. So before we're going to move on and talk about the, the research itself, I'd like to clarify what we're talking about. So real quickly in the chat window, if y'all could throw in, um, how would you define gratitude? Looks like the first thing that pops into your mind when you think about it. Don't have anybody giving thanks? Yes, yeah, definitely. Thankfulness, appreciation. Yeah, these are all constructs we see in the literature. Uh, so real quickly, I'm going to break down the different types of gratitude. And I think there's a there's a meme right here from the Princess Bride. And uh, Diego Montoyo says, at the clips of doom, he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And he's talking about inconceivable, but I think a lot of time gratitude researchers are talking about gratitude. So I'm going to break it down into three different types of gratitude. Um, the first type being two-part. And I'm going to give you a little story just to kind of help give a context for it. But my sister sent me flowers for my birthday. And they're peonies, my favorite. Uh, my, they had them at my wedding. She knew that, right? It was so thoughtful of her. So in the first type of gratitude, which I'm going to call two-part, I might have said, I'm so grateful for these flowers. So the benefit is the flowers, I'm the beneficiary. The second type is called three-part. So I might have said, I'm so grateful to my sister, so she would be the benefactor for the flowers um, on my birthday. So we've got benefit, benefactor, benefit, and beneficiary. Then the third type is something called four-part. And it's, uh, I might have said, like, I'm so grateful to my sister for thinking of me. She just had a baby, right, so it was pretty special. I'm going to send her some food from her favorite restaurant. I want to think about what she would want. So in that type of situation, we've got the benefactor, the benefit, the beneficiary, and this reciprocation, or at least this intent to reciprocate. And these are the concepts of gratitude that I looked at in my research. I looked at both two and three part and four part. All right, so let's move on to talk about religiosity. In the chat box, can you all just throw in how you think this might be defined in the literature or what you think it is? To go to a place of faith, yeah, so definitely religious attendance, um, frequency of prayer, all those types of things are seen in the literature. Giving thanks, yep, that's another one. So there's many different ways that it's looked at. Um, I used a measure that looked at it in two dimensions. It looked at it in transcendence, which is really this belief in God, but also in this interpretation. And today we're really going to focus on transcendence, which is this y-axis. Um, that looks at the inclusion of transcendence at the top being uh, a higher belief in God or a higher power and making exclusion of transcendence would be a lower faith or perhaps even um, a not, a, not a belief in God. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. These are the research, this is the big research question that I asked related to transcendence. So is the belief in God or a higher power associated with the expression of either two-part, three-part gratitude or four-part? What do you guys think? Do you think it was associated with these types of gratitude in my findings? You can just throw that in the chat box, too, if you want. You can say two or three part, four part, or both. doesn't matter. Four part. Okay. That makes sense, right? Because a lot of the time we think, well, maybe religious people, um, you know, they're really practicing this a lot. Four part. Well, right before I jump into that, I want to give you a quick look at um, who I asked this question to. So while we look at the development of gratitude in children, I decided to initially do this with college students. So thank you all the 211 students at UNCG. Um, that was really appreciated your participation. Mostly a Christian sample, mostly female, unsurprising, in an undergraduate HDFS class. And I used three measures. First critical belief scale, which looks at um, religiosity in those two dimensions. And then also two measures of gratitude. This gratitude questionnaire six, which contains items that are two part and three part. So looking at the three, um, benefact, beneficiary, benefactor, and benefit, as well as just the benefit and the benefactor, and then the four part. And the four part um, was a, is a qualitatively coded um, survey. It's called the Wishes of Gratitude Survey. And we asked, what is your greatest wish? And what would you do for the person who granted you your greatest wish? And we're coding to look for reciprocity in that. 
So the interesting part, the results, was really fascinating to me. I found that for part gratitude, the degree of transcendence, the degree of belief was not a significant predictor of gratitude for this four part gratitude. But the degree of transcendence, the belief significantly predict, predicted this two to three part measure. Um, and it wasn't a huge effect size, but it was significant. And so it's fascinating to me, you can see that here on the diagram um, on my model, that religious transcendence predicted this type of gratitude, but not the other type. And that really illuminated to me what I was seeing in the literature. There's a real difference between these, these different constructs, even though we're all talking about them using the same words. So some big questions came out of this, you know, to me, how can we be both grateful and ungrateful? Why are these results so contradictory? And of course, the answer is Diego Montoya, right? We're all using different concepts with the same name. We don't think it means what we think it means. And so this disparate definition really, really threatens this literature. It's hard to look over literature and really make any types of generalizations or to learn from one um, intervention to another. The other question I get a lot about this is, well, which approach reflects true gratitude? You know, what do you think? Um, and from our perspective and our research group, we really believe that this four-part virtuous gratitude is what we should be aiming for. This is the type of gratitude that creates where we're reciprocating to another person. And then that reciprocation happens again. And so we're building this cycle of gratitude. And that's what builds connections in families and communities and schools, right? Um, in society at large. And it's this, this gratitude as a virtue that really connects people and binds our society. I love this quote by Gertrude Stein. She said that silent gratitude isn't very much use to anyone. And I think that couldn't be more true. It's not enough just to say thank you. It's not enough just to acknowledge. I think that when we can, we should be trying to reciprocate. So some future directions that we've been taking this work. Um, we have completed some pilot interventions at the Greensboro Montessori School and the Experiential School of Greensboro. Um, and in that one, we actually included a treatment control. In both situations, we saw significant increases in movement from, in children who had, were not expressing this type of um, four-part gratitude with reciprocity to expressing this reciprocity um, in significant ways over the course of this, um, in the course of this four-week intervention. So that was really, really exciting to us. There's some possibilities there for including it in interventions in the future that we can perhaps put into curriculums for schools. We also created a grant to do something similar at Camp Beaver. Um, but instead of working directly with the children, we would be working with the camp counselors and talking to them about ways to encourage the development of this gratitude in children in their cabins. And that is a really cool situation because there's different cabins, which provides opportunities for controls in a really, um, in a really neat way. So that's pretty exciting. The other thing that we're doing, um, probably one of the things that I'm most excited about right now is an article that my advisor, John, and I have been writing for human development. Um, and the, the working title is, what is gratitude? The answer is ingratitude, it's just kind of a pun. But, um, and really what that's saying is that if we think about what ingratitude means, and gratitude is this kind of lack of reciprocity, right? If somebody does something for you and you have an opportunity to repay them and you don't, well, that would be ungrateful or ingratitude. What's the opposite? doing something. So that's what the article is about. Um, and it's really trying to push the field to embrace this four-part construction of gratitude in the literature. These are my references. If anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. Um, I'm really excited and passionate about this. I'm sure you can tell. So thank you very much. And Sam, I'll pass it back over to you. So it is, you were at nine minutes and 35 seconds. So again, the judges will um, take a second. Oh, Andrew's on. Okay. Hey, Andrew, I just unmuted you. Um, while the judges are doing it, do you have any questions or have a rubric or are you good? I'm good. I'm filling out the rubric and I'm, and I'm being very kind. Great. Perfect. That's <laughs> okay. I'm going to mute you again. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um,
So. Okay, and you're up next. So I am going to um, slowly start taking it back from you, Jessica, and um, share Anne's title. Sounds good. Uh, while the judges finish up. Can you still hear me okay? I can. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to slowly introduce Anne as the judges are finishing up that rubric. Uh, so Anne is also from kinesiology, and she'll be talking about the differences in brain function and structure between various degree of knee laxity individuals. So um, Anne, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, can you see can you see my PowerPoint slides? Yes. So take your time and you can get them into present mode. Um, I'm gonna mute myself now and again when it is clear you have start you have started your presentation, I will start the timer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Today I will discuss about brain activation in individuals with a high risk of ACL injury. In here, how many people have ever heard about ACL injury before? or know someone who turned their ACL. ACL injury is most common traumatic knee injury in sports-related fields. Yeah, same to say yes. Yeah, it is really common as injury in sports-related fields. The initial ACL injury is also increases the early onset of osteoarthritis. The evidence shows an 80% of likelihood of developing osteoarthritis within 15 years of ACL injury. Also, ACL injury often leaves patients unable to go back to their previous activity level, and also, unfortunately, it carries it with a high risk of secondary injury rate. Uh, let me take a quick poll right now. If you think females are, higher, females are, are at a higher risk of ACL injury, please click the uh, green checkbox using the participant's uh, participant screen. So if you go into participant screen, you will be able to click the green check screen. Yes, I can see that some people think that females are. And if you think males are at a higher risk of ACL injury, then please click this red X button in the participant box. And most of people think females are at a higher risk of ACL injury. Yes, ACL incidence rates are two to four times higher in females than males. Then why those females are at a higher risk of ACL injury? So previous researchers have studied risk factors of ACL injury in females among the multiple risk factors, such as anatomical, hormonal, and neuromuscular control, knee laxity is known as one of the most significant risk factors of ACL injury. Knee laxity is commonly known as loose knee joint, and it is also referred to as hypermobile joint or sloppy knee. And it is also known that individuals with loose knee joint have decreased sensory input from their knee to the brain, and it may cause them to have altered movement pattern. Then let's talk about why those um, individuals with loose knee joint have less sensory information. There are sensory receptors innervated in our knee joint. As you can see, there is a mystery receptor in the knee. And this, those receptors are stimulated when knee joint is loaded or deformed. And then it sends sensory signals to our brain 
and their brain processes these sensory signals and send them back to execute movements and also stabilize the joint. However, in the loose knee joint, as you can see in this picture, indicating sloppy knee, the receptors innervated in this loose knee joint may be stimulated less due to their lower tension of the ligament. Thus, it sends less sensory information to the brain. It may cause an altered movement pattern. Does, does everyone understand why individuals with loose knee joints have less sensory information? If you do, please click the smiley emoji in the, in the um, participant box. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, people understand. Um, or if you don't understand, please click on your face in the, in the participant box. It seems like a lot of people understand why individuals with loose knee joints have less sensory information. It's due to their sensory receptors innervated in their knee, less stimulated, and they send less sensory information to our brain. In the process of joint stabilization, we learned the important role of the brain. Our brain integrates and processes the sensory signals arising from the peripheral area and then they transmit it back to stabilize the joint. Moreover, our brain has a unique ability to reorganize its function and structure depending on the environment. For example, individuals with um, ankle immobilization, patients with ankle immobilization showed less brain activation in the brain region related to physical movement. Thus, I hear this research question. Since individuals with loose knee joints have less sensory information from their knee to the brain, and our brain has unique ability to reorganize its function, then what are the differences in brain activation between loose knee joints and tight knee joint individuals? If we can identify these differences, it may help us to fully understand how the knee communicates with the brain in individuals who are at high risk of ACL injury. It also may help us to develop brain-based rehabilitation for them. Thus, the purpose of this study is to determine how knee looseness impacts brain activation during knee joint loading, which is designed to stretch ACL to send sensory signals to our brain. So in my study, I examined eight female participants who are healthy and physically active. And then they are assigned into either the loose knee joint group or tight knee joint group based on knee loxy value using this clinical device. If I can use this clinical device inside of MRI to perform anterior knee joint loading would be perfect. However, any kind of metal materials are contraindication undergoing MRI scanner. So I designed and developed this MR safe joint loading device. While participants lay down the MR scanner table, air cuff is placed underneath their calf. The air cuff is hard to see in this picture, so I colored it green. And during the functional MRI scanning, the researcher inflate and deflate this air cuff at the adjacent operating room using the bicycle pump. And then this inflation of air cuff performs anterior knee joint loading and also stretches ACL. Knee joint loading task starts with 30 seconds of relax, followed by 30 seconds of joint loading for total of four cycles. Then I compare the brain activation between joint loading phases and relaxed phases for each individual's brain. And then I compare the brain activation uh, between loose knee joint group and tight knee joint group. The results reveal that the loose knee joint group has less activation in brain region related to sensory input. The red area in this picture represents the brain area which is less activated in loose knee joint group. This brain region also plays an important role in awareness of body's position. It may indicate that individuals with loose knee joints may, less, may 
may less aware of their body's position during physical movement. Thus, they also may be less sensitive to stabilize their joint when potential damage force is applied to the knee joint. Thus, we need some brain-based, uh, specific brain-based rehabilitation will be needed for individuals with loose knee joints to improve their ability to aware, aware of their body's position. One of the examples will be virtual reality training without visual feedback from their body. In this training, patients will be able to see their environment, but not, they will not be able to see see their body. So they have to concentrate hard where their hands and where their feet to complete the task. This may help them attain better awareness of their body's position during physical movement. Throughout this study, we learned that there are fundamental differences in brain activation between loose knee joint and tight knee joint individuals. Loose knee joint individuals demonstrated less brain activation in brain region related to awareness of the body. Thus, a brain-based rehabilitation for those individuals will be needed. However, this study is included only eight participants, so we need to view this study as a beginning step to approach uh, the research goal to fully understand how the knee communicates to the brain, individuals who are at high risk of a cell injury. Thank you for listening to my presentation. This is what I have so far. Thank you. Great, thank you. You were at nine minutes and 49 seconds. Great. Timing's great. Um, so again, this is the part where the judges are gonna take a second and uh, uh, tally their votes. Okay, so as they're finishing up, I'm going to take the reins back from you, Anne. Okay. And Mark, are you going to be ready after I introduce you? You bet. And Mark is our last contestant. You will have to go right at two. Okay. We'll finish up. Please remember, as um, we're gonna, as we're rolling into our last contestant, there is a People's Choice Award, um, and that I will send out right after Mark, so stay to vote for that. Um, just so that I have a heads up while people are finishing grading um, this last contestant, is that you do have to log in with a, some kind of Gmail account to access this form or be in a browser that you were logged in, but it is anonymous. Like when I show the results, it won't show your name. Um, and that is so that we don't have multiple votes. Um, it's just so each of you vote one time. So keep that in mind. So, our last contestant is Mark Snow um, from Kinesiology EDD. Uh, he is a fully online student, and uh, he is talking about the creation of online active learning faculty development page. So, Mark, are you ready? Yep.
more people in the room, so it's taking me a little bit to get to you. Okay, mm -hmm. okay here it is. Okay, so like all the others, Mark, I'm going to um, mute myself, and I will start timing you once it is clear when you have started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of this webinar. Uh, if you, I do have my video on so you can kind of see me, but if you need to, to get it away, away from the presentation, you can move that or you can just hit the reduce button. We will be doing some polling within this particular option. We're using a different uh, website called Poll Everywhere. So if you're available to use your web browser or your phone it, to go to pollev.com backslash marksnow082, it would be greatly appreciated. You can, we also will be using some QR codes. I wanted to be able to provide you guys some information if you wanted to take this a piece further going forward. And uh, this QR code actually goes directly to the poll.com, uh, pollev.com. I'm gonna speak a little bit about my dissertation practice that I've been working through that actually led into my practicum experience that I did this semester on creating an active learning, learning management system page for our faculty at my university. So this should be populating pretty soon. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time to upload, but I'm just going to speak for a little bit. Is There was a study done by Patrick Howell in Wisconsin in 2016 where they asked faculty and students' perception of learning. Uh, within that poll that you're able to get into, uh, my first question is, is what did you identify as what faculty stated was best practice in uh, the accomplishments of students' learning uh, outcomes. Is it problem solving, lecture, educational games and activities, or group and collaborative learning? And again, the instructions are at the top. If you need to take a look, that's available. You can even text message if you want to as well. Mm. I'll just give it a second to upload. And what was identified as best practice was actually A, it was problem solving, then next followed by group and collaborative learning, then followed by lecture, and then educational games and activities. So I'm going to clear this out and ask you another question, is what did faculty identify that they use the most often in the classroom uh, per activities? And it's the same answers going forward, right? And actually, that is correct. They did identify that lecture was what they used most often. So there was a little bit of a difference in between what they figured was best practice versus what they felt that they used most often. I'm going to ask one more quick question in here. And what did you think that student identi students identified from the four that was the activity that helped them to learn best in the classroom? Very good. And actually, uh, the number one answer was educational games and activities, which is kind of, it's funny because they identified as that as their number one, but faculty within this study, they identified it as last. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. It might take a couple seconds to upload. So basically what I wanted to be able to do is provide a resource that would allow our faculty to have multiple resources to pursue the opportunity of using active learning in the classroom. So within that learning management system page, we use Canvas, is to be able to define active learning, show evidence-based practice that active learning works, talk about how active learning wraps into assessment of learning outcomes, provide many examples of different types of active learning activities, and to provide solutions to those faculty that may see that active learning being a barrier. So this gives you, here's a QR code actually to the Canvas page itself. If you wanted to scan it, feel free to do so. Also, uh, I just put some snippets of what the learning page looks like. I couldn't do the full Canvas page because it's actually quite large, but I did a couple of pictures of, of the first points and you can see that there's an introduction and then kind of working into the actual um, 
examples as well. So I'm going to go a little bit into explanation of that going forward. And I wanted to be able to define active learning, so I provided multiple definitions, but Bonwell and Eisen in 91 did the umbrella turn of active learning and showed the importance of multiple students doing and engaging in things and thinking about what they're doing. Some research that I was able to put up that I found through uh, my literature review is that in Cavallo and West, students that volunteered to, per to, to perform active learning duties actually found that at the assessment at the end of the year, the students in the active learning voluntary activities were 8% better on the multiple choice questions, but 31% better on short answer and essay questions. So these students are actually achieving higher order thinking skills by just being incorporated in voluntary activities. Freeman et al. in 2014, they did a meta-analysis of 225 studies, and what they found was the, the failure withdrawal rate was reduced by 55% for those students that are in active learning courses. They also found that exam scores increased by about 6% per exam, which over time meant to be uh, a half a letter grade better in an active learning classroom. Eddie and Hogan looked at uh, learning gaps between socioeconomic ethnic groups and first generation students versus other generation students and they found that active learning classroom helps to shrink that knowledge gap by half. So I'm going to let this populate again but I wanted to see what you guys, if you guys can uh, get into the activity, is what do you think is the biggest barrier for students doing active learning in the classroom? Is it class size? Is it, that, is it the, uh, they're unfamiliar with active learning? Is it that they're comfortable with lecture methods? Or is it time? Somebody who can put them on so kind to please mute uh, your microphone. It would be appreciated, please. And we'll just see, there we go, what's population. And actually the number one piece that came up was, was was time, but these were actually different by department. So that's very interesting is that one particular department thought that they were unfamiliar with active learning, which is another department saw that time was an issue. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So what I tried to do is, as this uploading, I'm just going to talk a little bit more, is I wanted to be able to explain the process and try to work towards those barriers as much as I could, and then try to wrap that into by providing them several examples. Okay, let's see here why it's not changing the next page. I apologize. There it goes. Sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit. Okay, so I took a lot of information from Barclay and Major. It's a wonderful book if you're looking into learning assessment techniques, but basically it really wraps into you really have to understand the goals or the objectives of the course to determine the active learning activity and then be able to assess the outcomes. Um, and this, they basically, they matched their, um, matched the activity based on learning taxonomy done by Think. This is a learning goals inventory that can be scanned by the University of Alabama that allows our faculty to kind of do a quick survey and to determine where they kind of fall to help them determine what activity works best. Oh, and then basically it was just filling content. So K Patricia Cross Academy is a phenomenal website that has videos and templates that they can do, and they are organized by activity type, teaching problem addressed, and then thinks learning ta taxonomy direction. And then we're an iPad university, so I created a bunch of different videos using the iPad that show them different ways that they can use that within the classroom. And so the QR code below is actually to um, my YouTube page if you're ever interested in seeing that as well. Thank you. If you have any questions, please email me at mhsnow2.unc.edu, and there are my references. 
Great, thank you, Mark. So, as the um, judges are scoring and as um, we're figuring it out, I'm going to drop the um, link to the um, form for people's choice. If you're in the room, it is go.uncg.edu slash www.people. And uh, it should take you to a Google form again. If you need to log into some kind of Gmail account or be logged into one, it's still anonymous. Don't worry. Um, and that is how we will tally the People's Choice winner. Um, please, virtual attendees, do this so that we have a good uh, number of people to vote. Please vote. <laughs> Mark, I'm going to take it back from you. And uh, if you are willing to wait a couple minutes, we will start um, tallying tally the winners. Myself while we figure this out. So I'm going to meet myself while we're tallying. And again, be sure to go to go.uncg.edu slash www people to take this as well. It's in the chat. Okay, 
So here we are. Someone resent the voting link. So hopefully you all voted. We're wrapping this up. I know people have to go. So here we are. People's Choice winner is Mark Snow with Creation of Online Active Learning Faculty Development page. Congratulations, Mark. So um, from now, we're going to announce the first and the second place winner. So the first place winner is, let me pull up my thing so I can say this. OK, sorry, this is the first time we're doing this. So the second place winner is um, Anne, with differences in the brain function and structure between various degree of knee laxity individuals. Congratulations, Anne, you won second place. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And now for our first place winner, it is Jessica with Divine Thanks, Our Religious People More Thankful. So, thank you, Jessica. Congratulations. Are you still there? I think I muted you because, <laughs> sorry. You, you got yeah, uh, I had the power. So, Jessica, step first. <laughs> Oh, I just unmuted. There you go. Yes, Thank and you. Thank you for stopping out. Just, uh, uh, I don't think I said this at the beginning, and I know we're kind of nearing the end. Uh, just to remind myself what the prizes are. I put them on here. Um, first place is going to win $300. Second place is $200. And people's choice is $100. Um, thank you so much, Elvis. It was really close. Everyone did great, and I must stress, we had nine being the preliminary. These are the four that made it. Everyone's wonderful. Thanks, Elvis. And um, Jessica, Ann, and Mark, we will be in touch with um, details about how you will receive these prizes. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any thank questions you. or comments in the chat before we end this? Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, judges. And uh, next round of this.